This is chapter 17, the cardiovascular emergencies chapter. Now the mechanism for causing heart attacks is clot formation. So this is the person who has a lot of plaque development in their arteries, of their body, and that plaque attaches to the wall of the artery and then the body encapsulates it or covers it with an encapsulation to to try to minimize the effect of that of that collection of plaque. And what happens is is at some point possibly it doesn't happen to everybody but possibly that encapsulation ruptures or cracks open and the the, the gruel or the plaque comes out and your body recognizes this as an injury and like with any injury whether you cut your finger or fall and have an abrasion whatever it is your body sends platelets to that site of the so-called injury and those platelets start to clump together using the fibers that they throw the thrombin and the fibrin they lock together creating a clot which is a really great thing if you cut your finger but not so great if it's, if it's inside an artery in your heart. Now by definition, a thrombus is any blood clot that grows at the site of the occlusion. So this is the most common mechanism for someone who is having a heart attack, essentially. Now what this all looks like from a side view, you can see A, B, C, D, the, the four different diagrams here. You can see the endothelium, the inside lining of the artery it's very smooth, it's very slick, it's designed for the least amount of resistance to, to allow blood flow through the arteries as, as easily as possible. And But this person here, over the years, he's gone to In-N-Out Burger one, one too many times, he smokes, he drinks, he does not exercise, he's obese, whatever the risk factors might be, and he's developing plaque along the wall of the endothelium and that plaque damages the wall and then as this this no longer slick area more plaque grabs on and it creates this bigger and bigger and bigger encapsulation essentially of plaque so you can see a and then b is this progression this is years later and now the size of the actual artery that blood passes through has been halved in size. So only half the blood is getting through that artery that should normally uh, be getting through it. And this person on B here, he probably doesn't have any symptoms just yet, maybe. Uh, you go to the C diagram here, and this person's lost two thirds, maybe even, he's down to about a quarter of, of his or her uh, amount of blood passing through this occlusion this person's probably going to be or might be symptomatic. They might have what's called angina pectoris. So if, if they exert themselves, there will not be enough blood passing through that occlusion to, to, uh, to feed the heart enough to keep the heart happy. So the heart's going to start to hurt and the person's going to have some symptoms. But when they go and have a seat and take a rest or take a nitroglycerin, those symptoms might go away. And that's called that's called angina pectoris. Now the the D uh, diagram here. This person, what's different here now is there's that clot formation. The encapsulation's broken free, or it's cracked open, and now the platelets come. They create a clot, and look what's happened to the actual lumen, the size of the artery. Hardly anything's getting through now, and this is when this person's going to have a serious heart attack. Ultimately, ultimately, what it comes down to is this, this thrombus decreases the perfusion to the heart muscle. And if heart muscle is not getting sufficient oxygen and sufficient glucose and waste products are not being removed effectively, the heart muscle suffers. It can't contract effectively. And then eventually, if this isn't resolved, the heart muscle actually dies. And this is when people go into cardiac arrest.
Now there's different types of, of heart attacks and go through all of them here. Um, this is probably the number one you know, cause of, in America anyway, our diets are just terrible here. Um, there was a study done back in the 70s, I think it was, and they found out that on average, uh, adults at, at the age of 18 uh, already have started to develop plaque in their arteries at the age of 18. So you can only imagine by now uh, that it's quite a bit of junk in our in our bloodstream, but it is very tasty, you know. So there's two types of conditions that uh, we develop over time. A hardening of the arteries, or arteriosclerosis, this is a, an aging process. You see this in the elderly population. And this can play a role, obviously, as well in heart attacks, but it also needs to be kept in the back of our heads because if you think about it, uh, when you have an elderly person who's very sick or, or seriously injured and their body's trying to compensate for blood loss or some other condition where they need increased blood pressure, the problem with all this is, is their veins and arteries are not going to be able to constrict effectively. So they're not going to be able to compensate for shock as well as a younger person can. Something that we always keep in mind that people over 65, um, they don't compensate as well for those kinds of conditions. This is one of the reasons anyway. Uh, atherosclerosis, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is a plaque development. This is the coronary artery disease. You can see this is a cross-section of someone's actual uh, artery in their heart. And you can see where this person was when they died, because obviously that's their that's their heart uh, artery. So obviously they're dead. Uh, and you can see from this uh, picture down here, this person went in. They had a narrowing of this uh, art. This where these arteries meet right here. There's a reduction of blood flow, and the doctor went in and opened up that artery using a, a catheterization tool. And you can see there's increased blood flow through that. That's that group of arteries. This is what I was talking about earlier. So this is angina pectoris. So angina pectoris is a very simple term. Angina uh, just means pain, and pectoris means chest. So chest pain sounds uh, kind of fun. So what usually happens is, is people do get what's called stable angina. Uh, this is a person who's probably in this B diagram right here, or maybe even this C diagram right here, they're aware they have this condition. They have nitroglycerin on their, on their, uh, uh, at home, uh, on their person. They probably take aspirin every day as well. And they're out in the backyard digging a ditch or exercising, or they're going for a hike, or they're going for a run, and they're exerting themselves. And the problem with that, the exertion causes an increased uh, need for a cardiac output. So their heart starts to beat faster, it starts to beat harder. Well, unfortunately, there's not enough oxygen passing through the narrowed artery to feed the heart muscle in this exertional phase. So the heart starts to get ticked off, and it sends messages to the brain, and the brain stem, hey, you know, I'm hurting here, tell this idiot to stop. So the person starts experiencing a little bit of chest discomfort, they sit down, they take a nitroglycerin, they feel better. That's called stable angina. These people are aware of their condition, and it's, it's controlled by rest and nitroglycerin. Now, that same person, they have that same event. They sit down, they rest, they take a nitroglycerin, and the pain does not go away. That's now considered unstable angina. Something's changed inside their heart. Something's gotten worse, basically. This is when they call us for this. Now, myocardial infarction, if you break down the words here, myo means muscle and cardio is heart, and infarction basically means a death, essentially. So this is a death of a heart muscle. And remember, if, if there's a, a big enough occlusion, like you see in the D diagram here, and it's getting hardly any blood to the heart muscle, all the muscle being fed by that artery potentially can die and heart muscle does not regenerate. So this person, if this, this occlusion remains in place 
for over a period of time, like 45 minutes, an hour, 90 minutes, whatever it might be, the longer this occlusion's in place, um, the greater the chance of the heart muscle infarcting. This is why even though we consider a heart attack a medical problem or a medical condition, if you think about it, it's actually causing a traumatic injury to the heart muscle itself. The heart muscle is dying. So that's why when we suspect someone having a myocardial infarction, we want to take them to the closest uh, cardiac center as quickly as possible and as safely as possible so they can get their, their treatment in time to keep that heart from, from infarcting. Now, when someone is, let's say they're in the, uh, let's say we're in, in the B diagram here or the C diagram and they're going through uh, their angina pectoris phase and it does not resolve, like we talked about earlier, with the nitroglycerin and with the rest, they're probably experiencing myocardial ischemia. The term ischemia means low oxygen levels to the heart muscle. And it's more of a chronic thing. It's, it, it doesn't go away with the nitroglycerin. It doesn't go away with the rest like it would normally have done previously. And again, uh, this is what people are going to complain, complain about, chest discomfort. But remember that not everyone who's having a heart problem or a heart attack complains or has chest pain or chest discomfort. Uh, this is particularly with uh, elderly people, people who are diabetics. People who are diabetics, they get what's called neuropathy. And neuropathy damages your nerve endings and it makes your pain sensation, uh, almost numbs you essentially in certain parts of your body. Uh, elderly people are the same way. Uh, they don't have to be diabetics, but they can also develop neuropathy as well. So they might not experience chest pain like a you know classical heart attack might might present like essentially this is especially true in females elderly females in particular they are going to present very atypically they can complain of dizziness uh, abdominal pain back pain uh, they don't feel well today they have a flu i actually had one lady who complained of a toothache and it turned out that she's having a massive heart attack. So anytime you have a, an older female patient and they have any type of predisposition for heart problems, high cholesterol, uh, hypertension, previous cardiac problems, they're on nitroglycerin, they have aspirin, um, they have a heart history, and they're complaining of shortness of breath, uh, jaw pain, uh, weakness, dizziness. Think about could this be cardiac related? Are they having a heart attack? Remember, if you read the county protocol for the chest discomfort uh, cardiac uh, protocol, what it says essentially is uh, any suspected pain or discomfort of a cardiac origin. It doesn't say anything about chest pain. So if you're dizzy, if you're nauseated, if you're short of breath, if you're weak, those are all discomforts, essentially. And as an EMT in the county of San Diego, if you felt this person was having some kind of cardiac issue, you could uh, administer the nitroglycerin and the aspirin, following all the protocols and the contraindications and all that, to this patient as long as everything is you know, within normal limits anyway. So this, I think this this uh, this graph yeah, is in your uh, your book, I think, and this just differentiates between angina pectoris and myocardial infarction. And this is this is the typical patient. Again, this is not probably not going to be the elderly person or the diabetic. This is the just the typical average person that experiences one or or, or the other of these things. And what it really comes down to is people who are having angina. Uh, they don't really look sick. They're having chest pain. They can have a little shortness of breath, uh, but their skins are pink, warm, and dry. Their vital signs are stable. Their oxygen saturations are normal. Um, everything, you walk in the door and they do not look sick, essentially. Also, there's a good chance when you help them with their nitro, 
the pain will resolve or the discomfort will, will resolve. Now, on the other hand, myocardial infarctions, um, very similar symptoms and very similar signs, but just really much more accentuated. They're dripping with sweat. They're pale. They're cool. They're short of breath. Uh, they're clutching their chest. Their blood pressures can be really low. Their heart rates can be really low and even really high. These people, when you walk in the door, they just look like trash. And that's because they kind of are. So again, this is the very, you know, this is the typical presentations of these two types of conditions. Remember, there, there are those outliers, the really old people, and then there's the really young people as well. What I'm seeing in the field is, over the last 10 years or so, is I'm, I'm seeing more and more young people with heart conditions, and this is primarily due to methamphetamine or some kind of amphetamine product's use when they were teenagers. And now they're in their late 20s, early 30s, and they're having heart attacks. And so you, you can no longer think that a heart attack is an older person's condition because you're happening in younger and younger people, as are strokes as well. Another condition that's somewhat related, um, so we talked about the, uh, the endothelium uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the artery, and, uh, and it starts to get damaged by that plaque development. And you can see what happens here is the inner layer, inner lining, ruptures and it allows blood into the muscle layer, the middle layer. And this takes a while to, to happen. This is years and years of gradual uh, high blood pressure and high cholesterol uh, process. And then what happens eventually is it starts to create an aneurysm, which essentially is a bubble on your aorta. Uh, and that bubble eventually, unfortunately, can rupture. Now, if you think about this, if you remember from your anatomy physiology class, on average, an adult male or female have about five liters of blood in their body. And your heart pumps your entire blood volume in one minute. That means your heart pumps five liters of blood in one minute. So if you were to rupture your descending uh, aorta, like you see in the picture, that aneurysm right there, it goes kapow. Um, and your heart's still beating, how long do you think it would take for the blood to get um, pumped out of your aorta and into your, into your abdominal cavity? Well, about 45 seconds. You have about 45 seconds to live. Uh, so this is pretty much a fatal uh, process. Signs and symptoms. Uh, number one thing is a tearing sensation to the uh, abdomen that radiates through to the back. It's a gradual onset. It starts out as a tummy ache in the morning or when they wake up in the morning or in the afternoon. And by the evening, it's intolerable. They can't sit still. It feels like someone's you know, ripping and tearing. And it's kind of what's happening is, is the blood is now entered between those two layers of the, of the aorta. And it's, it's literally dissecting or ripping those layers down like you're pulling apart a you know, pulling apart two layers of something. Also, because of the way the aorta is positioned in the body, it, it descends down uh, just, just left of the umbilical cord. And this is in your ret retroperitoneal cavity or behind your abdominal cavity. And it enters your, your pelvic girdle. And there it splits off into the femoral arteries. Well, usually if this is going to happen, it usually happens down there somewhere, usually at or below the belly button. Uh, and so what can happen is, is this, this aneurysm, this bubble, uh, will usually wind up developing on the left side of the person's torso. So there sometimes will be less blood flowing down the left leg than the right leg. So if you feel their femoral arteries, and you notice that the left femoral artery is a lot weaker than the right, or you can even go pedal pulses as well. If the distal pulses are, are weaker on the left than they are on the right, that's another sign that this is probably a dissecting aneurysm going on. Treatment for this is uh, 
with recognition is going to be rapid transport to the hospital. Uh, I would suggest a trauma center because in, if they're large enough dissections, they have to surgically repair these and they have to do it quickly within 15 or 20 minutes. They got to get in there, open it up and, uh, and trap these and net them and control them. Uh, so I take them to a trauma center and there's always a surgeon ready on duty on, uh, to treat things like this there. And we talked a lot about heart failure in a number of other lectures, but ultimately uh, you really need to know about um, congestive heart failure. So if you think about it, the right side of the heart is the low pressure side, and it, because it only pumps out to the lungs, and the left side pumps out to the entire body, that's the high pressure side. When it comes to right-sided heart failure, uh, the right side of the heart has been damaged in some way by disease or heart attack and blood's coming back from the body to try to get back to the lungs to get reoxygenated but it the heart can't keep up with the supply and the demand so blood starts backing up out into the body and that's when you see the distended neck veins and the pedal edema in the ankles essentially people live with right-sided heart failure uh, it's a chronic condition they don't call us for that problem with right-sided heart failure is it does stress the heart out quite a bit. It does cause some uh, afterload issues as well. So the left side of the heart has to work really, really hard to make up for the right side of the heart. And eventually the left side of the heart will fail over a period of years. Now, if the left side of the heart fails and blood's backing up out of the left side of the heart, that's going back to the lungs and then that in increased hy hydrostatic pressure in the vessels of the lungs start to allow plasma to leak out into your lung tissue, and now you have uh, pulmonary edema, and that's now left-sided heart failure. Um, and obviously, if, uh, if the left side of the heart can't pump effectively, none of blood is being pumped out of the heart to keep your blood pressure normal, then you're now in cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic just means caused by the heart, essentially. Some of the signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. Remember, a lot of people who have right-sided heart failure develop left-sided, so you can see where it can all link together. Uh, cyanosis, remember, is a late sign of this. Uh, they are going to be breathing fast. And because of the, uh, the plasma in their, in their uh, lungs being agitated by they're breathing, that, that liquid starts to uh, turn to bubbles and eventually it fills up their lungs and they wind up actually coughing up this bloody pink sputum. It looks like bubbling, foaming blood essentially. Uh, so that's, that means their lungs are completely filled with, uh, with all this foam essentially. Usually their blood pressure, if if they're not in cardiogenic shock, usually their blood pressure is really high, and that's because of the heart failure that they've been probably living with for a while and the hypertension and all that. If they're, you know, in cardiogenic shock, then they're probably going to have really, really low blood pressure, well, be well below the normal minimums. Rapid heartbeat. A lot of times, the heartbeat is irregular. Uh, because a lot of people who are in uh, in uh, in, in uh, Heart failure have in, have what's called atrial fibrillation. Anxiety due to the hypoxia. They can't really lay flat because the fluid in there covers more of the alveoli and they can't breathe. You'll hear the crackles in their lungs, the, what we call the rails. Their skins are pale, cool, and clammy because they're releasing adrenaline. And of course, they might have that lower extremity edema, that pitting edema. This is what uh, JVD might look like. If you've never seen it before, you should not see this when someone's sitting up. That's abnormal. If you lay someone down flat in a supine position, like you're lying on the beach taking a sun bath, you'll probably see a little JVD. When someone's sitting up like this, as you see in the picture, and that's popping out like that, that's right-sided heart failure. And there's your cankles uh, or pitting edema, I guess. So if you, if you were to take your, your finger and you were to push in on that lady's ankles right there, they would, they would leave a pit or an indentation that your finger uh, caused. 
and that's why they call it pitting edema. Both of these are signs for both right-sided heart failure. Now here's a person who calls because they're short of breath. Probably the number one reason why people call or who are, who are in congestive heart failure is they're short of breath. You notice the vital signs, high blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. Their heart rate's fast. It's irregular. They're breathing pretty fast. It's labored. Their saturations are 84% on room air. You hear crackles in their lungs. They're talking to you. They're cooperative. This is a fairly common presentation of someone who has congestive heart failure. If you listen to the story, it's come on over the last 24 hours. They've been gradually getting more and more symptomatic, and now they just can't tolerate the breathing problem now, and that's why they call you. Now, treatment. Uh, treatment, of course, obviously, is these people need oxygen. So I would start them off on a non-rebreather mask. They need high flow oxygen. Um, I would, as uh, long as all the parameters are met, you can help them with their nitroglycerin. You can help them with their aspirin as appropriate. If the non-rebreather mask is not working for them, uh, they're not getting relief from that. You can go on to CPAP, like you see in the picture right here. Uh, and this is a positive pressure airway uh, device. So you actually forces the alveoli open and it increases the tidal volume and increases the effectiveness of air of gas exchange at the alveolar level. The only problem with this is that the person has to be awake, alert, cooperative, and they can't be fatigued because this device by itself, the CPAP device, can actually cause respiratory fatigue and they can stop breathing with this device if you're not careful. So they have to be not worn out. If they're worn out, don't use one of these things. Stick with the non rebreather mask or go on to a bag valve mask uh, or PPV type of process. Hypertensive emergencies. So these are pretty rare. I've only encountered a couple in my career, uh, but what happens is, is the person's body, who probably has a history of hypertension, they probably take medications uh, for that, beta blockers and ACE inhibitor type of medications for that. And what happens is, is their arteries spasm for some reason, and they have this marked increase of blood pressure. The highest I ever, I've ever seen I had one lady, her blood pressure was like 280 over 140, and, uh, and she was going through this hypertensive crisis. They get headaches, their eyes bulge out, uh, they, look, look, they look like they're scared or something, which they probably are. And for her in particular, she, her blood pressure was so high, a blood was coming out of her tear ducts. She was actually crying blood. It was coming out of her ears, her nose, and out of some of her pores as well. So I had never seen that before. Uh, I haven't seen it since, but it, it can happen with really high blood pressures. Treatment for this is just get them to the hospital, give them some high flow to uh, the doctor has to treat this by lowering their, their blood pressure. You place them in that semi fowler position, which is about lay them back about 30 degrees or so. So what you're, you're trying to find a balance between their blood pressure and blood flow to their brain. You don't want to cause them to have a, a stroke or something, which is you know ultimately Potentially, they could rupture a blood vessel and and stroke out. Uh, so we want to keep that try to keep that blood pressure as you know as low as possible on the way to the hospital. Uh, you when you're going through your patient assessment, you're doing your physical assessment, your modified or your head to toe, and you open up this person's shirt and there's this long scar down the middle of their sternum, like you see in this picture right here. Uh, that's a cabbage scar. And that's telling you immediately this person has had previous open heart surgery from either uh, some kind of coronary graft or valve replacement or something like that. If you do have a person who has myocardial or infarction going on, you can take them to a catheter lab. And basically, the hospital is going to decide which way to go on this. Catheter labs are very popular right now. The, because they're the low mortality rate and, 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 and very high uh, chance of success with these things. Thrombolytic medication, that's a, a medication they inject in the person's veins. It's kind of like putting Drano down the drain in your house, and it just basically reams out all of the pipes. It does have a higher mortality rate, though, than uh, the catheter lab, so it's kind of become less popular, um, at least here in San Diego County, anyway.
once they go in and they ream out that clot, that thrombus that I showed you earlier, they put what's called a stent in. And you can see what the stent does. It holds the artery open. Uh, when someone says, I have two or three stents in my heart, it means they've had two or three of these clots basically relieved and replaced by the stent. This is what it looks like. Uh, go inside there. You can actually, uh, the person's semi-conscious when this is happening. You can see that the doctor's watching the catheter enter the body and into the heart, and they're going in there reaming out and taking care of the whole problem and start inserting the stents. You guys all know about pacemakers, obviously. Upper left side of the chest implanted, and this basically replaces the SA node, gets the heart pumping, uh, uh, heart cardiac rhythm regular. People do have internal defibrillators implanted. They're very low voltage. They're not going to hurt you if you're touching them as they go off. And yes, you can still use your AED pads and your own AED if you have to. Uh, it works fine. Uh, LVADs. LVADs are something that's been gradually getting more and more popular over the last 10 years. These are, these are left ventricular assist devices. Uh, that people will get implanted in their hearts when they go into heart failure. The left side of the, of the heart fails. And these are, are uh, surgically implanted, as you see in the picture right here, and they take over for that left ventricle. There's a tube coming out of their abdominal uh, wall, and it goes to a battery pack, and the battery pack runs this motor, essentially. It's kind of hard to miss those tube come out of the uh, out of the wall of the patient's abdomen going to a battery pack essentially with that um, the one thing about the LVAD is because this is a constant velocity pump it's it's not probably not going to have a pulse or a blood pressure so this person you're not going to be able to feel a pulse because there's not there's none of that pulsatile movement normally found when the heart beats uh, so don't be surprised they're talking to you and they have no pulse and they have no blood pressure. They're talking to you, they're breathing, they're alive. Uh, the total artificial heart, that's a little different. This, the heart's been taken out completely. It's been replaced by a mechanical device. There's also a battery pack and wiring going out to that battery pack as well. They might have a blood pressure and a pulse. Uh, one thing about the, 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 uh, the TAW is that the county does not want us to do CPR on anyone uh, with these devices because we could dislodge these devices from their implantation. So you wind up calling a base hospital first and ask them permission to do that. The LVAD is okay. They still have their native heart, so you can actually do CPR on someone with an LVAD. Just make sure they really need it first. When it comes to the LVAD, if you hear a humming, uh, then more than likely the pump, if the green light is green on the battery pack and the humming is going on, that thing's working essentially. That's not their problem. Blood is circulating. Something else is going on if they're unconscious or something like that. And lastly, uh, Zoll uh, Corporation makes these defibrillation vests. And I wanted to bring this up because you don't see too many of them. Uh, people are prescribed these uh, and they wear them while they're waiting for an implantable defibrillator uh, surgery, uh, to be surgically implanted. Uh, these things are defibrillators. That battery pack and that uh, device there, right there in the black there, that is a, just like the one you carry on the ambulance, it shocks at the same voltage, essentially. Uh, these things recognize V-fib and V-tac, just like your, your AED does. And when it recognizes a lethal rhythm, it releases these gel packs. They're blue in color. The blue goop comes out. It's a conductive gel. And then about 20 seconds later, this thing says, shocking. It actually has a voice, and it will say, I mean, we're shocking now. And it shocks this person uh, through this vest. So if you arrive on scene, this person's there, and you see this gel goop going on here, and this thing says, shocking, you better stand clear because you don't want to get shocked. There is an off button on this. You can turn them off, and you can apply your own AED patches as well to override this whole process. But just be careful. They are, they are rather lethal for us if we don't recognize their, their placement. And we're 